our critical infrastructure by strengthening our military planning and our cooperation with the industry. It is almost uh, one year since uh, Russia launched its full-fledged invasion of Ukraine, the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. And we see no signs that Russia is preparing for peace. On the contrary, Russia is launching new uh, offensives. Yesterday, Defence Minister Resnikov updated NATO ministers on the situation and Ukraine's most urgent needs. I welcome the new pledges uh, of support made by NATO allies, including more heavy weapons and military training. This is critical. Ukraine has a window of opportunity to tip the balance, and time is of the essence. I want to thank uh, allies for their significant contributions, including to NATO's comprehensive assistance package. This is providing Ukraine with food, fuel, medical supplies, counter drone systems, and um, amphibious bridges. Ministers also discussed our commitment to our, to our other partners at risk, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia and Moldova. And we agreed to step up tailored support to enhance their defense capabilities, resilience and interoperability with NATO. Today, allies took uh, steps to further strengthen NATO's deterrence and defense. Since our historic Madrid summit, we have been making good progress, boosting our forward defenses and upgrading our readiness and defense plans. Allies agreed new guidance for NATO's defense planning. This reflects the reality that we live in a more dangerous world. With Russia's aggressive uh, behavior, the persistent threat of terrorism, and the challenges posed by China. NATO's defense planning will drive capability changes for the years to come and ensure that our deterrence and defense remain strong and credible. Ministers also addressed ways to boost industrial capacity and replenish stockpiles of armaments and munitions. NATO allies are providing unprecedented support to help Ukraine push back against Russia's aggression. At the same time, this is consuming an enormous quantity of allied ammunition and depleting our stockpiles. Allies agree on the need to work hand in hand with the defense industry to ramp up our industrial, industrial capacity. We are ready uh, 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 and we are reviewing NATO capability targets for munition stockpiles. And I welcome the important multinational projects agreed by allies today. These include a project on, uh, on ammunition warehousing, which will uh, support the pre-positioning and stockpiling of allied ammunition, as well as a project on ground-based air defence. Today, uh, ministers also addressed the security of critical undersea infrastructure. The sabotage of the North Stream pipelines has reminded us all of the vulnerabilities we face. Ministers tasked the NATO military authorities to provide advice on what more we should do including through better coordination and cooperation with the private sector. And I am standing up a critical undersea infrastructure coordination cell here at the NATO headquarters, led by Lieutenant General Hans Werner Biermann, a highly respected former German military officer. I will, uh, it will facilitate engagement with industry and bring key military and civilian stakeholders together to share best practices, leverage innovative technologies, and boost the security of our undersea infrastructure. At our summit in Vilnius, leaders will take further decisions to ensure that NATO can effectively coordinate between military, civilian, and private sector uh, to secure our critical undersea infrastructure. As we continue to adapt uh, our alliance, we need to have the right resources. So ministers also discussed the importance of investing in defense. 
more countries are now spending at least 2% of the GDP on defense. And 2022 was the eighth consecutive year of increased defense spending by European allies and Canada, with an additional investment of $350 billion. This trend is expected to continue this year, but more needs to be done. So today, allies discussed how to build on the defense investment pledge and future uh, commitments beyond 2024. NATO leaders will take decisions on this at our next summit in Vilnius. With that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, let's start with the BBC. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Uh, Jonathan Beale, BBC News. Um, you started this uh, meeting and, and, and the head of the contact group saying that, you making the point that Ukraine is using, and Russia are using, huge amounts of ammunition. You repeated that just now. <clears throat> and you warned about NATO's own stockpiles of ammunition, that production needed to be ramped up. First of all, have any countries actually now committed to ramp up their production, apart from the US and France, which you mentioned earlier, signing a new contract? And the, and the second question is, is, you know, we get a message from uh, Lord Austin, the US Defence Secretary, that Ukraine is getting what it needs. But what you're suggesting is that Ukraine might not get what it needs, that it will run out of artillery shells, tank shells, for example. So are you worried that Ukraine could run out of ammunition in the coming months? Thank you. So what we see is uh, an enormous uh, expenditure of ammunition, uh, and we have seen that for several months. And that's also the reason why we actually started to address that last fall. Uh, we, we, we convened uh, with uh, meetings with the defense industry. We addressed uh, this issue uh, in different NATO capitals. And now we see that things are actually moving in the right direction. Um, yes, uh, the United States, France have signed the contracts, but also other allies, Germany, Norway, and there are also others who have already signed contracts with the defense industry, meaning that production is now ramping up. And, uh, and, and that is making a huge difference. And partly it's possible to increase uh, production from the existing uh, 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 sort of factories, uh, capabilities. But of course, uh, you also need to make new investments. That will take some more time. Uh, but actually, both things are now happening, utilizing existing capacity more and investing in new production uh, uh, capacity. Um, so the production, for instance, um, Artillery shells, the 155, is now uh, uh, increasing, and that enables us to uh, both uh, replenish our own uh, stocks, which we have depleted, but also to continue to provide uh, support uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, uh, we also do this by working together. Allies are jointly uh, addressing the need to also uh, joint procurement uh, to, to make big orders from the industry. Uh, to utilize the economy of scale uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to place bigger orders and to give the defense industry the long-term uh, demand and the, and the long-term uh, uh, contracts. So yes, things are happening, uh, but we need to continue, we need to uh, step uh, up even more because there is a, a big need out there uh, to provide um, Ukraine with uh, ammunition. This is now becoming a, a grinding war of attrition and the war of attrition is a war of logistics, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore this is uh, so crucial for uh, our ability to uh, ensure that Ukraine wins, is able to retake territory and launch offensives that uh, ensures that uh, uh, it's able to, to, to win the war and to prevail as a sovereign independent nation. Sorry, yeah. so you're not worried that Ukraine will run out of ammunition? So we, ha we have seen the, the big need, and that's exactly what we have, why we have uh, uh, reacted uh, several months ago, and now we see that contracts are signed and production is ramping up and, and allies are producing more uh, to be able to continue to support uh, Ukraine. Uh, TT News Agency from Sweden. <coughs> Yeah, Victor Nomlin, Swedish news agency, TT. <clears throat> Following your doorstep yesterday, there's been uh, a lot of speculation if there is a new line on the membership process for Finland and Sweden. So, just to clarify, if there would be a ratification <coughs> for one of the countries, would NATO go through and complete the complete process for membership? Or would you still wait in order to 
get everything clear with both countries at the same time. So Finland and Sweden, they applied together. Uh, and all NATO allies made an historic decision together, all 30, to invite Finland and Sweden uh, at our uh, summit in Madrid. And then all allies, all 30 allies, also Turkey, signed the two accession protocols together. And I made it clear actually last fall when I went to Turkey in, uh, in October that, uh, that uh, both Finland and Sweden has now fulfilled their obligations um, uh, in the uh, joint trilateral memorandum they signed with Turkey in, in July. So I, I, I urged uh, uh, Turkey to, to, to ratify both Finland and Sweden together already last fall. So that's my position. And that position has not, has not changed. But at the same time, uh, we have also uh, seen that there are uh, different uh, assessments in Turkey uh, about to, uh, to what extent Finland and Sweden or so say, are uh, uh, in the same position to be ratified. And that is a Turkish uh, decision. Turkey has, Turkey has two documents, one accession protocol with Finland and one accession protocol uh, with Sweden. So the decisions we need to take as allies, 30 allies, have already been taken. 30 allies invited Sweden and Finland, and 30 allies signed the accession protocols. Now it's for the individual allies to ratify. 28 allies have already ratified both protocols, um, and then Hungary and Turkey has not. Uh, and therefore it is for uh, Turkey to decide whether they ratified both, and I have recommended that, or whether they ratify only one of the two documents. That's not a NATO decision. It's a decision by Turkey. So again, my position is that both Finland and Sweden are ready for membership. Both accession protocols uh, should be uh, ratified by all allies. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, uh, it is a decision by Turkey whether they ratify one or uh, both of them. But then, but, then the, but then the process is completed. There, there is no need for any unanimous decision anymore by NATO. We have made the decision. We have invited both at the same time. So, 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 so when Turkey uh, ratifies, then the process is completed. As, as long as also, of course, uh, Hungary and also Finland and Sweden do what they are uh, also now in the process of, uh, of uh, doing. So, so this idea that there is a need for a new and uh, unanimous decision by NATO is wrong. Th there are decisions that have to be taken by, by the individual allies, and two allies are not yet ratified. And of course, again, I, I have urged them for many months to ratify both at the same time. <laughs> and that's still my position, it has never changed. I've been actually pushing hard for Swedish and, and, and Finnish me membership. And, uh, and I am absolutely confident that both Finland and Sweden will become a member. Uh, at the same time, the sequencing is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that both Finland and Sweden uh, soon uh, become uh, uh, members of the alliance. And I, I'll push hard for that. I also actually travel to, to, uh, uh, to Turkey tomorrow. Uh, and uh, that will be one of the issues I certainly will uh, uh, address. Okay. And <coughs> Ömer Tuğrul Çam with Turkish News Agency Anadolu. Secretary General, could you please uh, give us the latest information about the relief efforts, NATO's relief efforts uh, for the victims of the earthquakes in Turkey? <coughs> All allies expressed their uh, deepest condol condolences and uh, uh, support to uh, Turkey, our ally. And, uh... and that was um, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg there speaking after a meeting of NATO defense ministers, mainly about uh, more help for Ukraine. And uh, DW's NATO expert Terry Schulz has been following the press conference in Brussels for us and joins us now from there. Terry, uh, just in broad strokes, what's, what's your take on what we just heard? Well, today was focused on uh, NATO securing its own defense and deterring Russia or any other enemy from moving uh, further 
into NATO territory, whereas yesterday they were talking primarily about what assistance they can give Ukraine. Of, co of course, those are basically the same thing at the moment because many NATO allies feel that if Ukraine does not win this war, they are next on the Kremlin's list. So these two things cannot be divided right now in the minds of many NATO allies. So what Secretary General Stoltenberg has just been explaining is how they d discussed uh, building up uh, their stockpiles again of weapons. Many countries have sent virtually all their weapons to Ukraine. If you're talking about the Baltic states, again, ammunition can't get away from that problem. Uh, he talked about uh, giving stronger signals to industry from NATO governments that they would have long-term contracts if they were to ramp up their production of ammunition. These are things that NATO needs to do for itself, but they also need to do it more urgently for Ukraine. And we have heard Secretary General Stoltenberg say time and again that if countries need to make a decision about keeping their stockpiles of weapons or ammunition up to what NATO would consider a comfortable level or sending them to Ukraine, he says, send them to Ukraine. Mm. Now, Ukraine's plea for fighter jets, uh, he did not mention. What can we make of that? Yeah, he didn't mention it yet in what we've heard so far. But, you know, that's not so surprising because there was no push on the NATO side uh, to have fighter jets discussed even yesterday. Uh, yesterday's Ramstein meeting, the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, uh, was, was about trying to get the deliveries that have already been promised on their way. So they really did not want to bring up what new weapons systems Ukraine may want. You know, they've got all these tanks uh, in the pipeline. Uh, they, they've got the ammunition problem. They've got spare parts. They've got training on their minds, and they very much wanted to make sure that they can send what's been promised and make sure that these systems can work together, make sure that Ukraine has the spare parts for whatever they're being sent, make sure that everybody's trained on multiple weapons systems so they can make the best use of what's already there and what's soon to arrive. Now, he's also been addressing the uh, question and uh, also the demand uh, of Zelensky really to speed up delivery uh, of ammunition and uh, also heavy weapons. Now, Stoltenberg said time is of the essence, but did he go into any detail how that can be achieved? Uh, that's right, and we've heard that not just from him, but from other NATO leaders here as well, that there, it's a critical time in the war. We know that Russia may have already begun what it's planning as its spring offensive. If it hasn't begun it now, it, it could be within days, certainly within weeks. And before the Ramstein group, the weapons generation group, uh, meets again. So uh, yeah, they're very much talking about how urgent the situation is right now, but there is a real problem in getting this equipment to Ukraine. We've heard in uh, Minister Pistorius, for example, yesterday, say that, uh, you know, why is it that, that allies were pushing us to make a decision on the Leopard 2 tanks, which we have now done, but we haven't seen them uh, being delivered to Ukraine. So I think there's some frustration on the part of allies who have made up their mind to move quickly uh, with those who haven't. And I mean, the, the logistical problems of getting such huge weaponry into Ukraine are not small. It needs to go through Poland. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's very difficult to do, but they have been managing up till now. And I I think that um, there's some frustration between the allies about how to do that best at the moment. Uh, and w we don't exactly know how that's going to happen. And some countries are said to be getting cold feet on even sending their tanks at all, partly because this, uh, this delivery problem is, is, uh, is so overwhelming. Terry, we're going to leave it uh, here for the moment. Thank you very much. Terry Schultz there, our defense correspondent in uh, Brussels. And meanwhile, Russia is intensifying its efforts to take the area of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine. Reports say Russian troops are relentlessly shelling more than 20 villages and towns in the area. It's become the site of the longest-running battle in the war. Analysts say any victory would be symbolic, as the city is not strategically vital. However, both Ukraine and Russia say they're determined to prevail. <laughs> This is a glimpse, according to Russian state TV, into what's become known as the meat grinder. The city of Bakhmut has been nicknamed as such because neither the Russians nor the Ukrainians have been able to make much progress here, resulting in a brutal stalemate that's produced the longest battle of the war and one of the bloodiest for all sides involved. Everyone can see that we're having a hard time on this section of the front. The enemy are constantly attacking in small and big groups. One day it's their artillery, 
and the next day their infantry attacks. It's a difficult time at the moment, but our boys keep standing their ground. The battle for Bakhmut is now in its seventh month. Russian officials recently claimed that its forces have almost encircled the city. Not so, says the head of the Wagner mercenary group, which has spearheaded the Russian offensive. We're pushing forward house by house, square meter by square meter. It's hard work. It's not clear at all where the stories about some kind of encirclement are coming from. Bakhmut will not be taken tomorrow because there is heavy resistance. It's grinding. The meat grinder is working. Despite the ferocity of fighting, Bakhmut isn't considered a game-changer in this war. Military analysts say the city holds more symbolic than strategic importance. But it's important nonetheless. Its capture would give the Kremlin a much-needed victory after months of setbacks and give its troops a new foothold in the Donbass region, which the Russians partially occupy but want full control of. For Kiev and its troops, Bakhmut holds emotional value. Nobody will give up Bakhmut. We'll fight for as long as we can. We consider Bakhmut our fortress. We consider people who died there heroes. Of course, the city is more than just a prize in battle. For Bakhmut's people, it was home. Dear God, our town used to be so beautiful. There were roses everywhere, flowers. It was clean, everything was kept in order. It's a memory that stands in stark contrast to scenes like this and the bloody battles that have earned Bakhmut its gruesome name. And earlier I spoke to DW correspondent Nick Connolly in Kyiv and I asked him to tell us more about why Bakhmut is so important for both sides. I think, yeah, this is about symbolism first of all. We heard there uh, Ukraine's President Zelensky talking about it as a kind of Ukrainian fortress or something that would not open up. Similarly, the Russians are desperate for anything that they can spin, sell outside the country, but also to their own domestic audience as a victory after all those setbacks and Ukraine like Kherson. When you look at the actual strategic importance, though, and the kind of advantages this would give Russia's troops in the region, less in the way of consensus there from military experts. Some even say that it's actually easier for the Ukrainians to retreat a bit and then defend bigger, more important cities like Kramatorsk nearby from the positions from the geography of Bakhmut. As we understand, the Americans have long been pushing the Ukrainians to give up Bakhmut, to not waste, to not risk more Ukrainian lives there. The task, they imply, has already been achieved. They've bound Russian forces there. They've caused huge losses to the Russian army in terms of human lives, but also technology, equipment on the ground. And now, you know, the suggestion seems to be it's time to cut Ukraine's losses. Mm. Now, there are reports uh, that Russian shelling is uh, intensifying, uh, and, but also that Ukrainian forces uh, uh, have uh, blown up a bridge uh, that, uh, that it would need to retreat. Is Ukraine losing, Bakhmut? I think it's really important to stress here that we have very little real-time information coming out of Bakhmut. That is the situation all along the front lines. You know, there is now no more access for journalists to Bakhmut. That's a recent thing. Uh, civilian volunteers and journalists are no longer allowed in. The reason being that you know, protecting them, looking after them, treating them with you know, providing medical services is just too much of a distraction for the Ukrainian army. We've definitely seen you know, civilian volunteers trying to bring supplies to the local population coming to quite a lot of harm in recent days. And often enough, the Ukrainian army, when things are going badly will only release information quite late but i think you know the fact that it has been closed off already says a lot and there's a sense here in kiev that you know people are around the fact that Bakhmut might have to be abandoned in the weeks and uh, you know months to come now there has been lots of talk recently that ukraine needs fighter jets from from the west in this particular battle the battle um, for Bakhmut, would fighter jets make any difference i think it's important to see here what those planes allow Ukraine to do. It's not about the planes 
as such about the prestige. It's about the fact that they firstly would enable Ukraine to protect their troops with, you know, from rockets, from missiles. It's a kind of further part of the kind of anti-air defense system, and it would allow them to project power forward to attack Russian positions far behind the front lines. You know, the kind of thing they can't do right now because they don't have long-range land-based missile systems. The West just isn't handing those over to Ukraine. But there is also the emotional component. Obviously, it's about getting the West to kind of, you know, be more wholehearted in support of Ukraine, to kind of nail its colours to the mast and say, we are on your side, and to not somehow, on the one hand, say we're in solidarity with Ukraine, but then keep stuff back. You know, the, the view here from Kiev is most of Europe is under that NATO uh, American nuclear umbrella. You don't really need this kit. We do. If you're not going to give us any security guarantees, then hurry up and send us this equipment. Our correspondent, Nick Connolly, there in Kiev. Thank you very much, Nick. Time now to get you up to speed on some of the other stories making headlines today. Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, has announced her intention to resign. The Scottish National Party leader took office in November 2014, soon after the independence referendum, in which people voted to remain part of the UK. Sturgeon is Scotland's longest-serving leader. A service has been held in Parkland, Florida, to mark the five-year anniversary